My mother was finally allowed to move and live with my father and me when I was in grade two of elementary school. At that time, I already had another younger sister. The five members of our family were finally able to live together in a small and crude bungalow type of house built on top of the flat plain. It was a time when people's material and spiritual lives were both extremely lacking. My father was the only university graduate in his factory, while my mother taught at a primary school in the town. As an intellectual family, we belonged to the five black classes. In a time when the working class was in charge of everything, our family was an outcast from whatever angle one looked at us. To avoid possible trouble, my mother didn't encourage me even to play with other kids. If I became involved in a fight with other kids, this could be interpreted as a class struggle and implicate my parents. The whole family would then have an even harder time. During many hot summer nights, when other kids were playing and enjoying the cool air outside, I shut myself inside alone at home. As there were way too many mosquitoes in the still wired flat plane, I had to hide inside the mosquito net to read in the suffocating heat while watching my perspiration dripping and leaving wet circles on the pages. Reading was the only enjoyment during my childhood. However, there were too few books to read. Many literature classics had been burned as poisonous weeds before and during the Cultural Revolution. In order to satisfy my desire to read, my father started writing children's stories for me and then gradually expanded his writing to other literature works, such as novels. He was a great lover of literature. My father wrote all his stories and novels on lined manuscript paper and then bound them neatly with cotton thread, making them truly thread-bound books, with each one of them absolutely the only copy in the world. Most of the time, I was the first and the only reader of my father's literature works. Whenever my mother found out about my father's writings, she would throw them into fire. Even if the stories were pro-revolution and catering to the tide of the time, such as little red gods catching a spy. My father never said a word when my mother burned his writings. However, he would always bite his lower lip in a unique way with an expressionless face, and this would always make me feel extremely anxious and scared. The only happy time then was Chinese New Year. My father's calligraphy was very beautiful, and all the big banners in the factory were all handwritten by him. Many people would ask him to write couplets for them to hang on their doors. Every year when Chinese New Year was approaching, he would definitely write a couplet for our own home. He was also a very smart craftsman. Apart from knowing how to shoe clothes, he also knew how to do carpentry work and make furniture. Many small pieces of furniture in our home were all made and painted by him, such as tables and stools. When it was Chinese New Year, he would make beautiful things such as red lanterns or a rabbit-shaped light with four small wheels underneath. My sisters and I would drag this rabbit light and swaggered through the street to show off this beautiful piece of artwork. All the children would look at us in admiration and awe, as they had never seen such a pretty rabbit light, nor could they ever dream about buying one from anywhere. Surrounded by those Xavier's eyes, we felt extremely proud and wonderful. One day when I was in the fourth grade in elementary school, a classmate suddenly whispered to me, Jiang Qing is a big band egg. I was really frightened by this outrageous claim. Isn't Jiang Qing the closest comrade in arm and the wife of our grand leader, Chairman Mao? How can she be a big band egg? How dare my classmates make such a frightening statement? Wouldn't she be immediately regarded as an active counter-revolutionary? But this frightening rumor turned out to be true very soon. 
The gang of four headed by Jiang Qing was really brought down. I didn't know that this also meant that the great proletarian cultural revolution, which had brought endless disasters to millions of families and which had caused more than 7 million deaths, had finally ended. I only remember that as a member of the performing arts group in school, we were required to stand along the scorching sun to wait for the arrival of the selected works of Mao Zedong, Volume 5, which would come from the faraway capital city of the county with big fanfare, loaded in big trucks and decorated with many red flags. It was an extremely hot day. The sun was so fierce that even the tar on the road was melting. When the long convoy carrying selected works of Mao Zedong finally arrived, we were asked to sing and dance to show our joy. However, my shoes were glued by the melted tar, and I couldn't dance or walk at all, making me feel like crying. After a period of time, I suddenly heard that the legal system, including the public security organs, procuratorial organs, and people's courts, which were all smashed during the Cultural Revolution, were all to be restored, and that people with professional knowledge were highly demanded. As a result, my father, who graduated from the Southwest University of Political Science and Law, was going to be transferred back to Mianyang and work at the newly established Justice Bureau. Mianyang, that was the capital city of the region, second only to Chengdu, the capital city of Sichuan province. I heard about this city a lot, but had never had the chance to visit it since childhood. I felt very excited. However, the party didn't arrange for my mother to go as well, as there was no mailing quota for my mother in Mianyang. Although my parents absolutely didn't want to be separated again, it was a good thing to be able to return to the bigger city from the remote small town and to do a job that suited my father's professional training. Isn't there an old saying in China that people should walk toward higher places? Furthermore, my parents believed that if my sister and I could go to Mianyang to study, we would have a better opportunity to attend a good university in the future. On the contrary, if we stayed at such a small town as Hanwang, we wouldn't get very far in society. In my mother's words, the only street in town was so short that one could even cover it from the start to the end when one fell down to the ground. Although I had always been the number one student in Hanwang Elementary School in terms of exam scores, my mother never failed to remind me, it's just like being a general among a group of dwarfs. She would also always remind me to remember that there are higher heavens beyond this one, and there is always someone better. So. In order that two generations of our family could have a better future, after just being reunited for several years, our family was once again split into two. My older sister and I went to Mianyang with my father, whilst my younger sister stayed at Hanwang with my mother. The Justice Bureau in Mianyang had just been established. It had neither its own office building nor dormitories for the staff. Instead, both its office and dormitories for staff were rented from a hotel building. My father lived in the male dormitory. My sister lived in a dormitory for female staff, whilst I became a boarder and lived in the student dormitory of Mianyang, Nanshan High School. So the three of us live in three different places. Nanshan High School is located halfway up in the hillside and is somewhat isolated from the world. It was said that in the Qin Dynasty, the imperial examinations were held there, so it has quite a long history. When I returned home on weekends, I squeezed into and shared the same single bed with my sister. There were many other female colleagues of my father in the same dormitory room. 
Occasionally, my father would cook some food for us in his office with an electric cooker, and this would be our special treat. My sister and I could only fight to get our food at the school canteen, which only supplied terrible food. Thus, until I graduated from high school for more than three years, my mother hadn't managed to move to Mianyang and join us. We could only travel back and forth to visit each other during our school breaks. My mother often said, it's so hard to earn money, and we only end up spending it all on the road. The good news was, my father's career seemed to have taken off. Firstly, I heard that a law firm was set up underneath the Justice Bureau. Then I heard that my father was transferred to this law firm and had become a lawyer. Then one day I suddenly heard that he had been ranked as one of the top 10 lawyers in Sichuan province. I heard that my father's most brilliant performance was that he fought three lawyers on the other side alone. The other party he had to fight was an honored teacher with national recognition and was very famous. This was why he was able to hire the three very good lawyers and one go to defend him. However, my father defeated them all and won that case brilliantly. These legends made me very proud. On the one hand, I really wanted to visit the court and watch my father's heroic moments of debating with numerous persons at the same time. On the other hand, however, I could hardly imagine how a somewhat dual person like him, who could spend a whole day without saying a single word, could have become an outstanding lawyer, as a good lawyer was supposed to be very eloquent and good at debating. Once I asked him, I heard that you never lost any case. What's your secret? He replied with a secretive smile, I never take a case that I can't win. When he said this, his smile was as innocent as that of a child. At the same time, it was also as calming as would usually be seen on faces of Chinese parents. It didn't make him look like a top 10 lawyer at all. After I finished my second year in high school and was about to start the third and last year, I needed to choose between literature arts and science as my future major. I was doing equally well with both courses. Many people said that it was better for girls to choose literature arts as female minds could do better in those fields. If girls study science, they can't compete with boys. Apart from knowing that I wanted to go to Peking University to study, I really didn't know what major to choose. My father said with much determination, choose science. No matter who is the chairman of the country, one plus one always equals two. After saying one plus one always equals two, my father once again beat his lower lip in that unique way with an expressionless face just as he did when my mother burned his literature works. This again made me feel very scared. I silently obeyed and chose science without any second thought. In 1984, my dream of going to Peking University came too. My major was, of course, science, and geochemistry in particular. At the time when I needed to leave my high school forever, I found that I had accumulated many things during the past three years. My father rode a tricycle to the school to help me move my belongings. It was very hard to ride uphill, and my father was soon wet through in sweat. Drenched in sweat, he rode and laughed, I'm a happy pit camp man, and mixed in his laugh, was a very undetectable trace of effort to flatter himself. My father was a very typical Chinese peasant intellectual who seldom expressed or showed his emotions, nor did he ever say any sweet words such as, I love you, to his three daughters. However, his flattering smile at that moment, when he said that he was a happy pet camp man, has been warmly engraved in my heart ever since. For me, 
that was his way of showing his fatherly love and care. When I was in the sophomore class, I received a letter from my father saying that he had joined the party. His tongue was very formal with a little bit of excitement. I was very surprised by this. Because of the special political environment in China, I remembered that my parents never discussed politics or state affairs at home, nor would they ever discuss their political views with their daughters. When I chose my future major in high school, my father's famous sentence that one plus one always equals two was the only statement I ever heard that included a little dose of politics. Why did my father join the Communist Party? Did he still have hope for this party? Or was it because he wouldn't be treated as a different species afterwards? Sadly enough, I never had a chance to discuss this with him. When I was in my junior year of university, mobilized by the political instructor, I also handed in my application to join the party. Recalling the motives now, I found there could have been two. One was my father's move to join the party. Ever since my childhood, my mother always said that I was my father's favorite and that he liked me most among his three daughters. Accordingly, I also held my father in high esteem. I cared a lot about what he thought and chose. I thought to myself, after experiencing so many hardships, he was still willing to join the party. It must be cause that he still had hope for this party. Another reason was that I was somehow convinced by this saying, even if the party was not good enough, it could be changed for better if more good members joined it and improved it from within. If we explore further, there could actually be a third reason. I had always been a so-called student of three excellent qualities since elementary school. Living in a society where everything was under control of the party, I had always thought that one should be excellent in everything, and to join the young pioneers, the youth league, and then the party was a natural path that a good student and a good citizen should take. Thus, I became the first party member in our class. When we graduated one year later, there were only two party members in our class of 30 students. Later on, I graduated, began my career, married, and had a child. Everything went smoothly on the path that was designed and hoped for by my parents. I had not only entered the best university in China, gained a master's degree, but also successfully entered the Development Research Center of the State Council, a workplace that many people wanted to get into but couldn't. At the same time, I also enjoyed love and a happy family of my own. At that time, my parents were so proud of me, and they had good reasons. My photo was part of the Education Achievement Exhibition in Mianyang in celebration of the 35th anniversary of the establishment of People's Republic of China, which was held at the People's Park in the center of the city. It was said that every day, thousands upon thousands of people visited the exhibition, and my photo caused quite a sensation. There was an old saying in China that inside an embroidered pillowcase was only grass, which means that good-looking people are usually very stupid inside and have no wisdom. So people felt it was hard to believe that a girl who was as attractive as an embroidered pillowcase could actually be admitted by Peking University. I had already left Mianyang when the exhibition was on and didn't know anything about all of this until letters of strangers from Mianyang suddenly flooded me. Some people expressed their admiration and some asked me to share tips on how to do well in school. I didn't understand 
why all these letters arrived until my family told me about the education achievement exhibition.